So, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm happy to move into our first session, for first full session of the day. If everyone would go ahead and take a seat. We will be talking around developing contexts of use, and the, the moderator for this session is going to be Dr. Klaus Romero. Um, Klaus has been at CPATH for, for many years now, and he is currently the, the Chief Scientific Officer for, for CPATH. And um, I will leave it with that brief introduction of, of Klaus, and in, welcome to the stage. Thanks, Nick. And uh, I can't tell you how exciting this is for me to see this happening. The, the, the transformation of translational sciences that is happening in front of us is absolutely fantastic. Uh -huh. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a very short high level overview of how to think about defining context of use statements. Then we're going to have uh, Nikki Sadre from FDA uh, give us a perspective on um, context of use from the farm talks side of things from CEDAR at the agency. And then Daniel Levener is going to give us a perspective from the developer side of uh, the equation. And so with that, let's go ahead and get, get moving with uh, defining context of use statements without tiers. So how do you take the tiers out of defining a context of use statement? Well, you need to ask yourself, what's the point? And the point is that these are transformative solutions that are intended to inform very specific decisions for drug development. But these solutions need to be adopted. If the solutions are not adopted, we can nerd out on the science and nerd out on the liver, which I love the, the presentation by Dr. Cohen uh, just now. And we can talk about that all day. But if the solutions are not adopted, we haven't solved anything. But in order for that to happen, for the solutions to be adopted, you need to have confidence from the relevant components of the ecosystem. Confidence, confidence in the science and the clinical meaningfulness and relevance of the information coming out of this of, of the different tools. And what are the components of that ecosystem? The components of the ecosystem are the development side of things for the technologies that are being used, the pharmaceutical side of the equation, and the regulatory side of the equation. So all three parts need, need to have an agreement on the level of confidence that is required to trust these solutions. So that's great, but that scientific solidity, even though it's necessary, is not sufficient without some level of a stamp behind such an agreement of the confidence. That stamp can have many different names, and we're going to hear from uh, potential regulatory pathways for the review and potential endorsement of the solutions themselves, not the products, but the tools that can accelerate those decisions in drug development. But in terms of the different pathways, we can, and I love to discuss with Jeff the different pathways and mechanisms, but at the end of the day, the pathways and mechanisms are intended to formalize that agreement of confidence from the different parts of the ecosystem that the solutions actually make sense. So what does that have to do with context of use statements? So every single one of these solutions needs to have an application, a very well-defined application. And that description of the application of the specific tool when you formalize that intended application for a regulatory conversation, that is when the intended application becomes a context of use statement. So first kind of demystification of context of use statement is a very well-defined intended application for a given solution. And once you have a well-defined context of use, now you have a compass for the kind of evidence that you need to generate and support 
to generate the confidence that will then ensure that the solutions get adopted. So, another way to think about this is that the context of use statement defines the question or questions that inform a very specific decision or decisions in drug development and how that question or questions are answered by the specific tools that are being proposed. So again, the context of use statement is the compass. But if the evidence requires to revisit the context of use statement, the context of use statement needs to be flexible and needs to be continuously adapted. It is not a shackle. You start with a well-defined context of use, you start generating the evidence, you look at the context of use again, and if you need to adapt it, uh, you adapt it as uh, appropriate. Another name for that is the learn and confirm paradigm. And with that, I will pass it along to the actual experts that are, are going to give us the perspective. So first, Nikisa, thank you for joining us. Uh, Nikisa has had an outstanding career at the FDA with a lot of experience, and she's going to illustrate the perspective from the agency. Nikisa, take it away. Thank you very much for um, this opportunity to give this presentation. So I am going to um, um, get to Delhi um, later on in my talk. I would like to start first really by um, kind of describing to you the world that the, the Farm Talks reviewers um, in Cedar kind of live in and, and the sort of the mentality with which, you know, they, they have to kind of work under. Um, so to get there, um, I have to begin with um, FEDORA, um, which is the Food and Drug Omnibus Reform Act of 2022, 20, uh, which kind of started a lot of interest in um, the use of some of these um, uh, alternative um, you know, approaches to, to testing. And what FEDORA did um, is really uh, a very small change in the language. It uh, struck out the term preclinical and um, you know, replaced it with the word non-clinical, and then it defined what non-clinical was. So in the act, preclinical was removed, replaced with non-clinical, and non-clinical is defined by a number of different things, such as cell-based assays, organ on a chip and microphysiological systems, computer modeling, other non-human or human biology-based test methods, such as bioprinting, and animal tests are still in there. So um, just to, to make sure everybody understands, there wasn't a radical change in the regulations. There was some change in terminology um, and um, uh, redefining of, of uh, what preclinical was. And, and animals were not gotten rid of in the um, language in the act. Um, if you look at the, at the CFR, though, um, the, which hasn't changed, the word in vitro appears in the CFR. It continues to appear, and it has appeared. It's been there for a long time. So if you look at um, um, you know, 21 uh, CFR 312.23 uh, on the pharmacology and toxicology, you will see that it says laboratory animals or in vitro um, um, in, in the language there as well as in the toxicology section, um, the words animal or in vit and in vitro are mentioned again and in vitro. So just to indicate that um, the FDA has been operating with the, the, the notion that um, both animal um, data are accepted as well as in vitro data and um, animal data and in vitro data have been submitted to the FDA all along. However, now there are opportunities to um, submit in vitro data um, that are um, um, sort of more in, in, in tune with the, the sort of advancement in technology, and that's, I guess, what we're here to talk about today, specifically focusing on Dili. And so um, just kind of getting back to what the regulatory framework kind of says, or maybe doesn't say, the, the FDA's legal and regulatory framework does not dictate the type or design of studies used. So it doesn't force people to use animals or in vitro, one or the other, um, to support that a, a drug be considered for clinical investigation. 
or reasonably likely um, to be safe in humans. Um, the areas where non-clinical methods would not be accepted to support the safety of, 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 of a drug are not imposed by statute or regulation, but um, they're instead um, uh, sort of dictated by the availability and reliability of scientifically valid non-animal methods in existence that are able to pr produce the data that's needed. And the provisions did, and they still do, leave it up to the FDA's discretion that methods and tests um, that are most appropriate be used under those circumstances. So um, having um, kind of given you a little bit of the background on the sort of ACT and the CFR, um, what, what is the paradigm under which the sort of farm talks um, in CEDAR kind of operate? Some of the key questions that farm talks tries to address um, in the um, um, evaluation of submissions that are submitted um, in the farm talks section uh, is to look at the pharmacological effect and the mechanism of action data. Um, attributes of drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. Farm tox um, generally determines the first in human starting dose based on the observed toxicities that are reported in the IND submission. The safe maximum exploratory dose in early clinical trials. Uh, possible consequences of chronic exposure. Risks to special populations such as pediatrics. Some parameters that um, uh, cannot um, that are to be monitored uh, in, in um, clinical trials more closely. Um, uh, then parameters that are unethical to be evaluated in humans. You can't do histopathology in humans. You can't do developmental and reproductive. You can't do carcinogenicity. These are types of things that would be typically measured in the um, animal and uh, non-clinical other non-clinical tests. And then to get an understanding of the mechanistic. Um, um, sort of um, underpinnings of any kind of adverse biological change that might be observed either in animals or humans. So um, the, the, I think people talk a lot about how much animals are used in, in drug development. Um, this table comes from a, a publication from 2005, um, and it's on the FDA publication. But um, in that paper, they, they looked at the um, usage of animals, and I think, you know, this stage is the, sort of like the stage five here is where things kind of like are at the FDA. So it's the work that's done for FDA to look at. You will notice that the majority of the animals used are used before the information um, is sent to FDA and they're used in the drug discovery process. And so, um, um, you know, what we're talking about is trying to decrease the number of animals here, possibly when we're talking about from the regulatory perspective. Otherwise, from a discovery perspective, you know, it would be to, this, to, to lower here where you would be able to have a much higher impact and where we said that um, for the contexts of use which are for discovery it is less likely that qualification or it's pretty unlikely that you would need to have qualification for, for those types of, of uh, methodologies. Um, and, and so um, to also highlight you know, why people do animal studies and why um, um, uh, sponsors submit animal data and, and why it's been depended on for, for so long, that animal studies provide uh, you with a, a lot of different endpoints that you can evaluate. Um, there are basically both in-life observations that are made while the animals are still under treatment and alive, and then there are post-mortem observations. And so, these really provide a, a, a huge amount of information and typically you would have um, five animals per sex per group for three doses and oftentimes it'll be in two species of animals so there are quite a lot of, of, of actual um, tissue samples that you would end up um, and, and observations and so from clinical observations to body weight, food consum consumption, all sorts of um, monitoring for electrocardiography and, and sort of respiratory rate, echocardiography, you know, to the post-mortem observations, which is looking at histopathology and, and you know, actually looking at the individual tissues, um, you, you, you get a lot of data from that. So you can imagine that from a single animal, you're going to get all of this information and all of these um, endpoints are going to be um, um, really be evaluated in the context of, of sort of like the interplay between these different systems. And so now what we're trying to do is to see how we can leverage some of these new approach methodologies to um, 
supplement some of that information. And I think that ultimately the goal is to, to reach the, the three R's, which would be the replace part is I think what a lot of people are interested in. But I think that we shouldn't um, undermine the, the fact that uh, reducing and refining are also very, very important aspects, which I think um, is where we are most likely to see um, impacts of co uh, complex in vitro systems to begin with. And so um, when we talk about new approach methodologies, what we're thinking about are really in vitro methods, in silico methods, and alternative organisms such as, for example, zebrafish. So these are the types of, of models. I think that you know today we talk about complex in vitro methods and microphysiological systems, but there are other types of systems I mean, that, that would fall under um, this, this sort of like uh, NAMS. So I think that this type of figure has been shown today, um, you know, which kind of describes um, the, the process. And so you kind of start with discovery and then you try to, 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 to narrow down the, the candidates to get to the studies that are going to support your IND. This is, you know, at this stage is where the FDA becomes involved. And, and this is before the first in human. And I mentioned that this is where Farm Talks makes a determination as to what is the safe um, starting dose. But in this little kind of like box here, um, I think what's important to see is that there are a number of methods that are used in order to narrow down the drugs that are in the discovery pipeline. And if you will notice, a lot of these models are, are you know, using a lot of high throughput screening tools. Um, one thing that is really not um, um, uh, a sort of a strong point of some of these complex in vitro systems is the throughput capacity. So, you know, one area where potentially there might need to be um, um, sort of um, progress is to increase the, the throughput um, if, if these methods are to be potentially more useful to later on down the, the line. Um, and, and also um, uh, the fact that, you know, as I mentioned in animal studies, you end up looking at multiple animals. In a lot of these complex in vitro systems, you, look, you have one um, donor that you're looking at. I mean, you can have maybe more than one donors under certain circumstances, but generally speaking, you're not looking at a great diversity. And so I think that these are some of the challenges that will have to be overcome. I don't think that they are insurmountable clearly, but you know, we're trying to identify areas where we can all agree that we need to, um, you know, focus on as the, the, the sort of low-hanging fruit in order to be able to, to get to a context of use which are going to help in the regulatory area and really more in this, this part of the, the kind of progression here. So then what are some of the challenges for complex in vitro methods to overcome? I'm, I sort of see it as you know two two types. There are some fundamental challenges, and then there are some methodological and practical ones. So th the diversity of different tissues and cell types that make up a living organism is clearly one of them. I mentioned that when I was talking about the whole animal studies. So hundreds of different types of cells are uh, are are taken into account in an animal model and at various stages of development, and they may respond differently and to different degrees. Um, the ways in which cells and tissues interact, both locally and via the bloodstream and the nervous system, the immune reactions, germ cell development, metabolism, and, and sort of under disease conditions and, and under normal sort of healthy conditions, it, it's, it creates a lot of um, interaction between these cells. Um, and so there are um, likely to be you know, outcomes that depend on that interaction. There's also the influence of, influence of tissue organization on the cellular environment, oxygen level. I mean, I think that um, Dr. Avigan uh, showed the, the sort of three zones in the liver and, and, and the oxygen levels and, and how that impacts um, the biology and the, the, the biochemistry of the tissue and obviously the physiology at some levels. And so um, the rate of nutrient supply, inter, intercellular communication, barrier formation, these are all affect cells and how they behave. Um, and respond to the external st stimuli. But there are also these methodological kind of challenges, which is um, the ability to reproduce reagents. Um, I mentioned, um, you know, cells, that the donors that you use, which types of donors, how many donors, the media conditions, um, the, the sort of lack of confidence in reproducibility and the robustness of, of the complex in vitro mo models. Um, we we um, have experience having used some ourselves that there is um, there are great challenges in trying to reestablish methods that have been developed in by by manufacturers and that might work for a manufacturer setting them up in other laboratories is not so simple 
it takes a, quite a, a certain amount of characterization work in order to be able to get the systems up and running. And, and quite frankly, the systems are quite different from one another, so that also creates some challenges. And there's a, the lack of standards uh, for microphysiological system device components as well as performance parameters, which are likely to pose some challenges. So uh, I think the, the, uh, this kind of like I'm trying to get to the context of use and, and Dili, I think that um, um, Dr. Siegel defined uh, context of use, so I'm not really going to spend too much time on the definition of it, but I, I would like to highlight the fact that during, you know, depending on whether you're earlier on and you're kind of got a, uh, trying to, to use a CIVM for discovery versus for a non-clinical kind of like um, study um, and to replace an actual um, animal study or pivotal uh, in, in a pivotal talk study, clearly the, the sort of consequences are going to be different. And so you are not likely to need any kind of um, qualification or validation done for, for this type of, of um, uh, you know, CIVM. Whereas here, it, it's possible that you may need to, to have, um, you know, um, some level of, of validity um, assessment to be able to, to draw conclusions. And so, again, I think Dr. Siegel uh, uh, um, talked about the qualification, and so he defined what that is, so I'm not going to talk about that, but validation as well. I think that, you know, typically for validation, a lot of different um, sort of principles, which are, um, these come from the OECD guidance, you know, the, the sort of rationale for the assay, relationship to event points, to in vivo effects of interest, detailed protocol, intra-test variability, repeatability, repeatability reproducibility, um, a lot of different types of test performance criteria have to be taken into consideration in order to go through a formal validation process. So, um, you know, um, basically once a, a context of use is defined for a specific new approach me methodology intended to inform regulatory decisions, the FDA must be able to then evaluate the applicability, limitations, relevance, reliability, reproducibility, and the performance standard of that method in order to confirm that the tests have been appropriately validated. And in addition to the technical validation, biological and toxicological models and assays can also be qualified. So. Um, it's not just uh, the sort of technical performance of it, but you, you can sort of try to get validation for specific um, toxicological um, um, endpoints. Um, when a method will be to support the safety of a drug for use in clinical trials or marketing, the data submitted for qualification will need to be sufficiently robust to give a high confidence um, of the method. And so I think determining the level of robustness is, is, is um, um, could be challenging, but um, again, it's it's. Um, I'm, I'm sure that we can come to agreement as to what would form criteria for establishing these criteria, this sort of like um, the robustness. Um, the methods that are being um, used to explore um, the potential pharmacology of a drug to screen out the candidate, which is something I mentioned, something that's not likely to require qualification. Um, and the uh, FDA is probably unlikely to accept, and I think the Dr. Siegel mentioned that, we have received some applications through the ISTAN program. They were for, for screening um, purposes, and, and those we have not um, typically um, you know, encouraged for submission um, to, to that program. And the level of validation and qualification of a NAM is going to depend on more the user needs than those um, uh, of the FDA. Uh, and they might be more or less um, rigorous, um, and, and also you know, over time, as the, the mo models are being developed, I think that the context of use can be refined further. So there, there's a bit of, um, I think it's not as rigid as, as one might think. Um, so um, that there are ways to kind of work through um, some of the, the sort of issues for qualification um, and, and validation. So now I'm going to get to Dili. I don't know how many minutes I have, but hopefully I'm going to try and finish quickly. I don't have too many slides to go, but I think um, um, uh, Dr. Avigan talked um, uh, in, in great detail about uh, sort of mechanisms that, that lead to, to liver injury. And, and really, you know, um, I think that um, while there are three, you know, um, sort of mechanisms, the, the sort of um, indirect and uh, idiosyncratic um, and the direct um, toxicity, I think that we can also tease it out into kind of like um, immune mediated and non immune mediated um, um, for the purpose of this discussion. And um, a lot of the parameters that can be assessed are, are could be the same for both medi um, immune mediated and non immune mediated. You could end up with the same types of things, which is like mitochondrial um, dysfunction, reactive metabolite um, accumulation, cholestasis, um, a bile salt excretion, um, you know, inhibition, lysosomal impairment, and these could end up in um, manifestations such as cholestasis, cirrhosis, um, cholestatic hepatitis, and, and some of the other like vanishing bile duct, um, you know, uh, which have been mentioned previously. But you know, the 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 
and, and there are methods that are available to assess a lot of, oops, sorry. Um, there are a lot of there are methods that I think um, uh, Dr. Avigan mentioned as well that where we have a battery of tests that can actually help assess the, these specific types of toxicities, and and um, the the current mechanistic understanding of DILI includes the activation, however, of both the adaptive and the innate immune system, which really are those um, endpoints that currently are not being evaluated with these the methods that are are, are here, and and these are you know largely in, in response to these danger associated molecular pattern molecules, DAMPs, which were also mentioned previously, as well as um, drug metabolite exposure. And, and they are going to lead to these kinds of toxicities. And I, I think it was mentioned before that one of the major risk factors for, for idiosyncratic DILI is really the specific um, HLA haplotypes, which also create um, some challenges when um, um, sort of designing these complex in vitro methods. So when, when the immune system is, is involved, now you have a situation where you're really combining the worst case scenario from, from everything. You have, you know, really the um, um, kind of um, uh, drug-related um, metabolism-mediated sort of like hepatotoxicity and the immunological uh, reactions that are combined together. And so that makes it, um, you know, a very complicated um, sort of um, system to, to um, try and, and replicate. Um, and so the, because the hepatic immune system really involves interplay with, of a lot of different cell types together. And so, you know, um, you have the sort of, um, you know, Krupa cells, dendritic cells, but then you also have a lot of the different types of the T cells, CD8, CD4. And so all of them together, they're going to kind of coordinate to, to give you this, this immune response at the end. Um, but really, the you know the, the Kupfer cells are the first kind of like um, you know line of defense, and so the response of the I think Kupfer cell is something that's um, important to assess. And I think that these complex in vitro systems, which incorporate oftentimes Kupfer cells and cellulite cells in the, the models, um, have the capacity to be able to start addressing some of these questions by starting to look at some of the uh, maybe innate immune system um, and and looking at and from what what I know, I don't think that there are you know, um, that's not being done um, as, as routinely as looking at ALT, ASC, albumin, and, and, and urea, for example. So it's possibly trying to look at some of the factors that are released by the Kupfer cells might be um, uh, a, a sort of like a, a starting point for doing kind of like some of the work to incorporate more um, CIVM into the assessment of DILI and to add to the basically the list of, of um, models that I, um, you know, methods that I mentioned here to be able to look at additional types of mechanisms of, of um, toxicity um, for DILI. And so the considerations for CIVM in DILI assessment, um, I guess what we have to keep in mind is that drugs that have caused severe DILI in humans have really not shown to be clearly hepatotoxic in animals. But then again, they haven't been shown to be hepatic, hepatotoxic in humans either because otherwise they wouldn't have gotten on the market. Um, so um, it, there's a challenge because of the, the, the specific kind of toxicity that we're trying to look at. And, and so when DILI is suspected, it's really essential to gather mechanistic information in order to assess the risk of pursuing drug development. And there's a need for predictive in vitro methods that can better evaluate the potential for DILI and um, especially uh, idiosyncratic DILI. So some examples, I think I only have a couple more slides left, um, to a couple of examples of considerations to think of. Um, um, you know, what is the exact context of use? When and why would the model be used in drug safety? Yet, you know, these are some questions. I'm not. I'm not going to answer them. I'm just saying that you know, in terms of like trying to, to stimulate further conversation later, I think that these are some of the things we need to think about. Um, and then, what are the specific features of the model which make it equipped to adequately assess the mechanisms involved in the immune-mediated DILI? Which drugs should be tested as positive and negative controls to measure the model predictivity? What are the functional DILI endpoints that you should and can evaluate in any particular um, CIVM? And what are the range of values for each endpoint that are being evaluated? I think that these are some of the things that when somebody wants to qualify a model is going to have to, to really take into account. And so um, um, opportunities for possibly integrating CIVM into the drug development. So these are really kind of like um, hypothetical um, um, situations that I'm bringing up, but I think that you know, these are things that, that we really should, you know, be thinking about, and, and that's the direction we want to go. So if any organ toxicity, for example, is seen in only one animal species, but not in the other, then, you know, it would be good if there was a, a, a relevant and justified human cell-based CIVM that would maybe help to alleviate the concern about potential toxicity in the human. So I think that, you know, 
that would be a situation where uh, you're not replacing the animal study, but you have differences in responses in two species. And here you're using the CIVM as kind of like the tiebreaker to be able to tell you, okay, like you know, this, the human's gonna behave more like the, the rat or the dog. And so that I think is, a, is an opportunity. If the CI, there are CIVM, from multi multiple um, you know, species of animals, then these could be help, you know, used to investigate which species is gonna be the most representative to the, you know, for the human, um, and specifically for a particular target organ. So ultimately the goal would be to avoid doing studies in animal species which may or not add value. So you know, if you can show that, that you know, doing a study in an animal is not gonna add value by using CIVM with the, the uh, sort of from the animal um, species um, from which you, you, um, you know, um, you know, you would, that you would like to not use, um, then I think that, that that's an area where um, it could be particularly helpful. I, and I, I think that um, as we all try to use less non-human primates, this is, I think, an area where we should really be thinking about um, um, where there, there might be contribution to, to lower the number of non-human primates used in animal studies. Um, if a drug, drug belongs to a class of drugs with a known safety problem, so then um, the CIVM might be helpful to demonstrate the lack of a known mechanism of toxicity. So I think that that also can be helpful. So you're not showing the toxicity, but you're showing that it is not acting by this mechanism. And I think that that would be, um, you know, um, a useful um, sort of data for, for um, regulators to have. If there's a risk that's identified in the clinical studies, then CIVM with specific context reviews can help to really understand that risk. And so I think that this is again when you start seeing a little bit of maybe delay um, um, uh, sort of um, uh, signals. And I think that um, I think Dr. Cohn's uh, um, sort of first case scenario, you know, maybe there was a little bit of an increase in some of the liver enzymes, you know, um, maybe if, if um, you, you might have some CIVMs to go back and evaluate and, and better understand what would be some potential um, you know, reasons why that particular drug would kind of cause that by looking at some parameters where some of the maybe immune components are affected, that would add some information or at least alleviate concerns uh, or try to allow um, the, the drug to keep progressing, um, although it's not in line with, um, I think, what you were told on the first day, which is to kill the drug as soon as possible. You might have to kill it a little bit later, but you know, that's <laughs> to be kind of like, um, uh, it's, that's another consideration. And then also for types of situations where you have a weight of evidence approach, which currently, I think there are two um, um, ICH guidelines, um, the ICHS5, for development and reproductive and ICH um, um, S1 for carcinogenicity. Weight of evidence approaches are being um, sort of encouraged in those types of um, scenarios. I think that again, there are opportunities there for, for uh, CIVM to be helpful in that kind of situation. So um, in conclusion, you know, I'll kind of go back to this, this figure here. And so again, you know, I think that the, the, the sort of context of use where you're trying to limit risk and, and predict liver toxicity are you know a little bit different from those where you're trying to do a risk assessment and understand the toxicity and uh, understand the risk and i think that um you know um these are two aspects that have to be taken sort of um in, in context and um incorporated into the thinking as to the purpose for why you're using particular methods and i may have gone over time so i'm sorry um thank you very much Thank you so much, Naki. So that was a great presentation. Okay, so I'm going to invite uh, our next presenter, David Lerner. Love the fact that you are uh, not only a serial entrepreneur, but a technologist, but you have formal training in aerospace. I, mean, I can't wait to hear that embedded into the development of these solutions. Right. Go for it. Hello, everybody. I'm Danny Levner, uh, Chief Technology Officer and one of the co-founders at Emulate. Um, as you heard from uh, Dr. Strauss this morning, our goal here is to bring stakeholders together. And my job here for the next 10 to 15 minutes is to give you a little bit of a taste for the developer side, the people who are actually trying to make these uh, uh, these CIVIMs. Uh, because our goal here over the next couple of days is really to try to triangulate the, the regulatory need as well as the developer's capabilities. It doesn't you know, help if we come up with a need that isn't addressable uh, today. Now, the examples I'll use are from Emulate and from Spheroids, which are two technologies that I'm most uh, familiar with. Uh, but really, I tried hard to make sure that what I say here today uh, is as broadly applicable across different developers uh, as I can. Now, I won't belabor the introduction much. Uh, we all uh, know the need. We know a lot of drugs fail in clinical trials. We know a lot of drugs are withdrawn 
uh, from market. Uh, we know there are regulatory moves in the US, in Europe, in Canada, other countries as well. Uh, and in particular with DILI specifically, it's a problem both in clinical trials. Uh, some statistics say that 13% of uh, clinical trial failures are due to DILI, uh, and 21% of post-market withdrawals are due to DILI. And one of the reasons that DILI is especially important is, as you've heard in some of the previous talks, there is a risk of loss of life. So this is something that we need to take very, very seriously. Um, and it's a relevant problem, right? It hasn't, there's some thoughts about chemistries have improved, the mechanisms and biologics are different. Maybe it's not a big deal anymore. Uh, so we've been monitoring actual withdrawals or stoppages of, of uh, clinical trials over the past year and a half or two years. There have been eight high profile holds or stops of clinical trials. So it's still a very relevant uh, problem. Uh, and as we all know, uh, we are here today to talk about the potential for some of these new technologies So here we're calling CIVIMS, that we go, go by some other names, uh, to address this, uh, this need. So, so much for the uh, uh, introduction. Uh, there are several of these on the market. Again, the two that I'm going to talk about most because I'm most familiar with them are the uh, liver CIVIMS that we uh, produce and emulate. We call it the liver chip, as well as spheroids. I'm particularly familiar with the uh, Insphero product because there's some very good uh, analyses of that uh, product. But again, this is not meant to exclu exclude anybody else uh, uh, on the market. Now, um, I thought it would be prudent to come up with some common language or common categories for us to talk about. You've heard a lot of different uh, use cases, context of uses for, uh, for DILI, uh, but they actually divide nicely in some categories. And again, it'd be useful to have those uh, categories and divides in mind so that we have a common language uh, to discuss them. Um, actually, Nakisa hit, hit on this already uh, in just two slides ago, but one big divide is between the predictive toxicology use cases versus the mechanistic and investigational uh, use cases. Uh, let me start maybe from the right. Mechanistic investigational toxicology is when you're seeking to understand a toxicity that you've actually observed. So maybe you've done an animal study and you've seen some toxicity in the animal study and you want to understand whether that toxicity is still relevant uh, to human and what dosage might be relevant and so on. So mechanistic investigation toxicology is about understanding, uh, understanding toxicity and it's usually done after doing animals because you're looking to explain something that you've seen in another system. Now on the other side of the spectrum there's a predictive toxicology which you don't already have an indication of some sort of toxicity. You're trying to assess the risk that such a toxicity will arise later on. Now, where is that used? Where is that context uh, applicable? It's usually alongside or even prior or after to uh, after animals, right? Because uh, uh, you're just gathering evidence. So you will hear more about weight of evidence approaches. In this predictive context, you're not just going to stop with a CIVIM. You're still going to run other systems. Uh, you're going to try to gain as much information as you can in order to predict a toxicity. And one thing about it here is I've subdivided the predictive box into two subdivisions. What I'm calling, I made these terms up, but what I'm calling broad scope DILI. Broad scope meaning um, we, we don't know what we're getting into. We really just want to get more information on DILI in a broad context uh, versus narrow scope, which is where I'm putting things like uh, immune mediated DILI, which, which of course is not narrow at all. There's many subcomponents to immune mediated DILI, but it's narrower in the sense that you're coming in with a much more focused question about the mechanism or sets of mechanisms that might be uh, involved. Now, another aspect that I want to highlight, which you've heard about in some of the previous talks as well, is the idea of regulatory purview. Because here today, we're not just talking about this whole civim industry and its impact on pharma. We're trying to bridge, uh, you know, to have this conversation specifically in the regulatory context. And it doesn't help for us to come up with a great application that's completely irrelevant for the FDA. We want to make sure that what we talk about here today is in the regulatory purview. So let me give you two examples, and these are just examples of of things that fall on either side. Uh, one application is where you run these CIVIMs ahead of all animal data. And this could be really useful because if you see toxicity in the CIVIM, you can say, oh, okay, I don't need to run the animals anymore, or I can uh, change how I do the animals or go to my backup compound or whatnot. This is great in support of 3R. We're very much in support of 3R. I'll, I'll talk about how that integrates into, uh, into this whole world. Uh, but it's probably not in the regulatory purview because if you saw the toxicity, uh, you're going to change something. You're not going to submit that particular compound to, to the FDA. 
On the other hand, uh, the contexts that we are here to talk about are ones where uh, we do want to be in the regulatory purview. So that probably means a weight of evidence uh, discussion together with other models, including uh, animal models. And in this context, maybe it's less of a three hour conversation because we still need to run the animal models for that weight of evidence discussion, but we want to make sure that the CIVIM actually is relevant and submitted uh, to the regulators for, uh, for review. Now, um, for the next couple of slides, I want to dig into the three different buckets of, uh, of context of use that I just described. So let me start with this mechanistic investigational toxicology bucket and specifically talk about, you've heard about it already, uh, Nikisa nicely presented, for example, in, in the previous talk, uh, but I specifically want to highlight its challenges from the developer's point of view, because that's what I'm here uh, to do. So a classic example is you've done your animal studies on two different species. One one of the animals came back, one of the species came back clean and the other one came back with a, with a talk signal. And now you're left scratching your heads, you know, what evidence do I need? You know, first of all, maybe this is legitimate, I should just dump this compound because it's, a, it's going to be toxic to humans. Or if you're convinced that it's not, what evidence do I need to gather in order to build a case that this is going to be reasonably safe for, uh, for humans? So there are two eventualities that, that I'd like to walk you through. We actually have this whole table uh, fully worked out in, in a recent publication. One example is where the human, human CIVIM comes up with a positive signal for toxicity. Uh, this is not the eventuality you want, but in that case, okay, you have a human system that's saying, yes, this toxicity exists, uh, you're probably going to stop. Uh, this is actually not in the regulatory purview because you're not going to submit the, the drug to the FDA anymore. So the more interesting discussion for us is what if the human CIVIM comes up with uh, negative? Now, if it comes back with negative, there's two possible things that could have happened. Either truly the drug is not toxic to humans, it was just toxic to the animal species. And when I say toxic, there's of course, you know, gradation to toxicity. I'm just trying to make this a simpler discussion. So uh, let's say it's, uh, it's negative. It could be truly not toxic uh, to humans, or it could be still toxic to humans, but that specific mechanism that you saw in the animal is not recapitulated uh, within this civim. So you actually left sort of in a, in a question still, it's not a very clear. Now, you can, you can have a lot of clarity in a situation if you already understand the mechanism that you observe in animals, you have a really clear understanding that that mechanism does exist in the human civim, and maybe this is sufficient and you can stop. In many other cases, you don't have the clarity or at least you want to build evidence, so you're uh, asked to run a, uh, an animal version of that civim. Right, the thought is, if you can reproduce the toxicity in the CIVIM animal version, then you know that the technology as a whole is capable of capturing that mechanism and gives you that much more confidence once you rerun it in the human version of the CIVIM. So it sounds great. So this is maybe more from the kind of the regulator and pharma perspective, but let me tell you why this is a concern uh, from the developer's perspective, which again is what I'm trying to do. Um, Animal versions of CIVIM sound straightforward. Take the same technology, in our case, for example, a, a liver chip, uh, put animal cells instead of human cells on there. Uh, it turns out it's not that easy, right? So first of all, cells uh, need to be QC'd and sourced. Uh, it's not always easy to find animal versions of cells. You'd, you'd figure that it would be, but uh, actually we, we really, really struggle, and not just us, but other liver groups uh, really struggle to find good source of animal cells that meet the quality that, that we need. Uh, the protocol actually needs to be modified, different uh, ECM uh, coatings, different uh, you know, concentrations, different seating densities, and so on. Uh, different acid kits, so the ELISAs need to be different because the antibodies are different for the animals than they are for, uh, for human. And different validation studies because now you're not just validating the human results, now you actually want to do a separate validation study on the animal results to know that the animal civim does a good job of reproducing what the animal in vivo does. So all in all, this is now a separate product. It sounds easy to take the human product and change it into animals, but in reality you're talking about a standalone product. Uh, this is hard. This is something that we as developers now have to develop essentially, maybe not from scratch, but uh, there's a lot of work here to be done. So this is one of the reasons why developers may say, animal chips sound great, uh, it's a whole lot of work not happening in the near future. Uh, so practically, this is not a nice match between the regulator needs and what the developers are ready to do uh, today. And then, um, 
uh, the data that we need to, uh, to, de to develop this, to show this. Uh, you want to look at a scenario that I have here on this table. You want to look at cases where the animal uh, showed something and, uh, and the drug was not toxic to humans. Well, there's two problems with that. Uh, first of all, a lot of these things right now would just be left on the shelf. If there wasn't the right system to show that the drug was safe for humans, uh, which is what we're trying to, to develop here, uh, it would never get to humans. And if it never get to humans, we don't actually have the truth data to know whether the drug was safe or wasn't safe for humans. So that's one scenario. Uh, the other case is where uh, the pharma company, the sponsor, uh, did manage to get this to humans, so find there's some uh, clinical data. When that happens, we actually don't know that there was a problem in animals uh, because that information is kept confidential. Uh, we've talked to FDA, we've talked to different groups about this. Turns out that that data still belongs to the sponsor. Uh, perhaps a consortium type arrangement could get the sponsors to release this data. Uh, in our preliminary conversations, it looks like they're worried about that. They're worried about potential liabilities of disclosing, uh, you know, talk signals and so on. So uh, again, very practical, uh, you know, sounds easy, right? Let's just validate this particular context of use. Getting the data in order to do this validation currently is outside of our capabilities. Perhaps that's something that we can all put our heads together and figure out uh, how to do. Now, switching gears, let me switch to uh, narrow uh, context DILI. Uh, here, the canonical example we've heard about today is uh, immune-mediated DILI. So I'll try to speak both generally about narrow context, but also specifically about immune-mediated DILI. Unfortunately, I didn't really clean up the slide to, to separate the two. Um, uh, immune-mediated DILI, uh, there are some uh, groups, some, some companies, and certainly a bunch of academics who have published on capturing immune-mediated DILI in CIVIM. So there's some work here. Uh, it's not as advanced as other contexts for SIVIMS. It's, you know, preliminary or early commercial, uh, not as developed as, for example, broad context, uh, uh, Dilly. Um, now, why would you want to run, why would you have a question that is specific to a narrow context Dilly as opposed to just opening the door and saying, I want to know about all kinds of Dilly? Uh, there's two answers to that question. One is, I like, you know, divide and conquer here. Uh, one side is that you already suspect that kind of Dilly. In that case, you're actually back to this investigational mechanistic toxicology. If you actually know that that, that type of DILI is, is particularly prominent or, um, or, or that you've seen a signal, uh, you're back to that investigational context. And in investigational context, you have the set of problems that are presented on the previous slide. The other approach, the other side, is to say, OK, this is a class of compounds, class of uh, drugs that is prone to this type of toxicity. So that's why I want to zoom in on this particular set of mechanisms uh, of toxicity. And uh, um, uh, let's, let's look at one such example. Uh, let's say biologics are known to induce uh, uh, immune-mediated uh, uh, toxic toxicity. And there's two problems now, again, in terms of practicality. So let me, let me be clear, immune-mediated DILI sounds very relevant. We've heard a lot of conversations about this, right? It's a problem that I'd love to be solved. But in terms of practicality from the developer side of doing it now, uh, one problem is let's look at uh, biologics. Uh, there are very few drugs out there, biologics out there, that have made it to market that we actually have the, 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 gr the ground tooth to, to know whether they did induce immune-mediated DILI probably less than 10. That probably is not enough to truly validate a CIVIM, that smallest set of uh, drugs. Uh, the other thing that we heard about today is HLA typing. Uh, you're probably not going to be satisfied if we just do it in one, two, or three different uh, donors. You're probably going to want to look at, I don't, I don't know the number, but 20, 30, several dozen of these. Um, it's challenging today to even get three different good liver donors, human liver donors for, our devel for developers. Uh, to say that we now need to test on 30 different HLA backgrounds is basically impossible. So uh, my point here is absolutely great context of use from the need perspective, very, very difficult from the developer's perspective. If we spend all our time in the next two days uh, writing requirements for this, we'll end up with something that's great and probably not practical for the next five years. And then lastly, the broad uh, DILI context, uh, you'll see, of course, that this is where, where I'm pushing. Um, I'll talk in a minute about different objections, but the reason, the motivation for this is, as we've heard from several talks, is, you know, this is still pertinent, 13% of uh, clinical trials fail, 21% of withdrawals, and so on. 
In terms of development status, uh, there are uh, several manufacturers that are pretty advanced in this. There have been uh, specifically at least two different larger studies that are specifically looked at sensitivity and specificity in this set of context of use, and there's probably even more uh, coming online um, as well. And uh, one thing to make it very, very clear here, uh, nobody is talking about re re replacing animals for this context is used in the regulatory uh, version of this, right? We are talking to pharma groups about testing for Dili early on where they might be able to reduce uh, the number of animals used. For what we're proposing to regulators, nobody's suggesting uh, that we do away with animals. So we are looking at a weight of evidence argument where CIVIMs are combined together with animal testing to create a more complete picture of, uh, of toxicity. Now, to show you some specifics, these are the two studies that, that I mentioned that I know of. Uh, we at Emulate published something uh, last December, uh, was generally meant to follow the IQMPS guidelines, uh, and then Inspiro, together with uh, Will Proctor, um, put together a very nice study, I think it was 2017. Uh, so there is some data here uh, to show you the highlight from our result, uh, we got 87% sensitivity of drugs on drugs that are known uh, to uh, be daily positive that have made it into the clinic. In our study, we also looked at uh, the sphere of comparison based on literature values. We got them to have 47% specificity. The Proctor study specifically talks about 67% because they looked at a different uh, data set. But I want to be really clear that right here, we're already talking about a uh, weight of evidence integration of animals with uh, CIVM data because we're saying that the 87% is on top of drugs that were cleared into the clinic by animal studies. So really we're talking about a uh, about eightfold reduction in the number of toxic compounds that uh, would go into the clinic based on the drug set that we looked at. Uh, in here. We've done a follow-up uh, which actually elucidates specifically what this integration weight of evidence framework would look like. This is the table that I took a snippet out of the different combinations of animals said this, civim said that, how does that integrate? And another thing that I, in retrospect, wish I expanded on, but it was mentioned in one of the earlier talks, um, we found that the tool could be used not just in a binary fashion to say toxic, not toxic. Uh, there's actually a quantitative output from this technology that can be correlated to the severity of the, the daily scene. So it can give regulators a better sense of you know, the kind of grayscale of the risk tolerance they're willing to, uh, um, to take. Happy to talk about that later. Uh, just to conclude, um, uh, so what kind of objections do we see with this broad daily context? Uh, one objection is uh, broad daily is no longer an issue. We want to focus on specific um, uh, types of failures. Uh, we feel like the evidence is that there's quite a lot of daily uh, that is, is, is affecting people. And as we heard, sometimes uh, you know, even if you catch daily, it may be too late for the patient, so there is a risk of life uh, with daily. Another one that, uh, uh, that we hear about is um, the CIVM is missing mechanism X. You know, you don't have circulating immune cells, you don't have whatever it is. Um, absolutely true. Um, we would argue that don't throw the baby out of bathwater. Catching 87% is not as good as capturing 100%, but it's 87% that you caught that was that would have otherwise gone to the clinic. Uh, don't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, that's one part. The other one is this whole integration with animals weight of evidence argument. If you integrate the CIVIM alongside animals, then the goal is to actually get the best of both worlds. Animals still catch whatever it is that animals were to catch. The CIVIMs catch whatever the CIVIMs are able to catch that animals were missing. Together, we have a better safety net to capture uh, bad actors. And then lastly, uh, CIVIMs will fail uh, good drugs. This is, this is a very legitimate concern. Uh, getting a good drug on market is very, very hard. It's a needle in a haystack to find the one uh, good drug. We can't afford to throw away good drugs because we have a better uh, safety net here. So how do we know that we didn't uh, throw away any good drugs? Well, uh, some CIVIMs, I can speak to ours, for example, um, report are reporting 100% uh, specificity, which means no false positives. So the system is geared to not throw away good drugs. Now, you might say, how is that possible? How could you uh, 
um, you know, you must have tweaked something, control the threshold or whatnot. Well, uh, uh, we did set the, the threshold to, to be suitable for a system, but this is not a fluke. Uh, different systems are prone to different kinds of errors, type one or type two errors. Some systems are prone for throwing away more false positive versus uh, false negatives. In our experience, uh, the liver chip in particular does not seem to create a mechanism of toxicity that we didn't see somewhere else. It's just not the type of error it's prone to. It, it might miss a mechanism of toxicity. It doesn't seem to hallucinate, to use a word from AI, uh, it doesn't seem to hallucinate a mechanism that didn't already exist. So, uh, but this, of course, is something that we can put into the, uh, the guidelines. This is something that we can put in a qualification guideline is some sort of control around uh, false positives. So just to, um, uh, to conclude, this is my last slide. Um, in choosing what context of use we want to spend the next uh, couple of days, uh, we need to look, of course, at the, the ranking that the regulators and pharma are able to provide, but we also have to cross-reference that with what developers are able to do uh, today or in the near uh, future. Uh, we also have to make sure that that's in the regulatory uh, purview, and then that the data to actually run this uh, study is, is available, right? So we, we don't design a study that's impossible uh, to run. Um, the overlap, as I've kind of hinted, the overlap of these needs and what is possible uh, may not be where we expected it to be walking into this meeting uh, today. So what I'd love to see in this meeting is for us to find the right overlap of what regulators need and what developers are able to provide so that we can come up with something that we can act on in the near future as opposed to saying, you know, in five to 10 years, we'll have a, you know, we'll have a guideline for something that's gonna come down the road. Uh, there are low hanging fruit, there are opportunities already to find things that, uh, that are actionable today and I'd love to see us uh, do this uh, here. All right, thank you.